بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. So the very first article of faith is to believe in the absolute oneness of God, believing in the angels, the next one, believing in all the prophets, you know, the ones which I showed, and all the ones which also not mentioned up there. The very first one, Adam, the last one, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We believe in all the books, the books that were given to Prophet Moses, the book given to David, Prophet David, the book given to Prophet Jesus, some scrolls that were given to Prophet Abraham, and obviously we believe in the book that is given to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But we believe in those books that were in the original forms. So those books were only for those people according to Islam and for that time. And we say that you know, because of the long time in history, some of the books, they did not came down to us in a pure form. Some of them, they were edited and altered and revised. So, God, so what God did was, according to Islam, He sent His final book with the final messenger, Muhammad peace be upon him, the Quran. In the Quran, God promises, in chapter 15 of the Quran, verse number 9, Inna nahnu nazzalna zikra wa inna lahu la hafizun. That it is Allah, it is God who has revealed this reminder, this book. He is the one who is going to protect it. You'll be amazed to find out that when this book was given to Muhammad, peace be upon him, he became the very first memorizer of the Quran, of this whole book. From the first page to the last page, he memorized the whole Quran. All throughout the ages, there have been people who have memorized this. Like tens and hundreds of people in each single generation. There are no less than 10 million memorizers of the Quran in the whole world. There are about maybe 15 or maybe 10 Muslims up here. There are at least two Muslims that I know in this room who memorized this whole book. And I want them to stand up and recognize yourselves. Go ahead, go ahead, stand up. There you go, one and two. Give them a big hand. Yes. Good job. Can you imagine? You know, it has like literally thousands of passages, hundreds of pages. They memorize the Quran in the original Arabic language. Yes. In Arabic language, if I open the book over here, he could be facing up there and he could recite from the first page to the last page, right? And same thing with uh, Hudayfa too. So, so that is one of the miracles of the Quran. The second miracle of the Quran would be, you know, many, many of us, we are people of science. This is a scientific age. Out of the 6,000 passages of the Quran, no less than 500 plus of them they deal with the modern scientific facts. For example, if, if we go and ask any cosmologist, you know, when did the world began or when did the universe began? How did it begin? They may say that about 13.8 billion years ago, the whole universe was in one primordial mass. And then was a big explosion. And then from that we have all the galaxies, the stars, the planets, and all the things in the universe. Quran says in chapter 21, verse number 30, that do not the unbelievers see that the heavens and the earth, all things, they were joined together in one mass. It is God who split them apart, right? Seventh century book. Without any technology, without any instruments, MRI machines, telescope, microscopes, the Quran mentions this truth about 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about the shape of the earth as being round, chapter 79, verse number 30. Quran speaks about embryology, right? I mean, I'm from the medical field, how the fetus grows inside the mother's womb. Chapter 21, verse number 12, 13, and 14. Chapter number 96, verse number 1 to verse number 5, and many, many places. So there are 500 plus scientific truths in the Quran to make us realize that this cannot be from the 7th century human being. This has to be from the Creator who knows us, who knows the truth, and He has placed those truths inside here for us to ponder that this is from God. The next slide speaks about the five pillars of Islam. I want you to tell me who, what are the five pillars, right? Many of you raised your hands that you have read about Islam. So what could be some of the five pillars of Islam, right? We could help each other out. 
Yes, sir. Uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. Pilgrimage to Mecca, very important. Pilgrimage to Mecca. Yes, so that's one of the pillars. Yes, ma'am. Praying five times a day. Somebody here. Yes. Yeah. Giving charity, obligatory charity to the poor, the needy, the homeless, right? We are down to two more. Fasting, Fasting in the month of Ramadan. The last pillar. Yes, sir. Shahada, Shahada which means what? Yes, so Shahada means that you are testifying that there is no God but Allah and Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of God. So those are the five pillars of Islam, right? Uh, so what we will do now is uh, we'll go directly to some of the important topics. Here are some of the teachings of Islam. I mean, this is just a very abridged version. Do not be rude in speech. Refrain your anger, be good to others, do not be arrogant, forgive others for their mistakes, speak to others mildly, lower your voice, do not ridicule others, dutiful to your parents, protect the orphans, try to be the peacemaker between the people. So when you pick up the copies of the Quran which are free for all of you, you will find out that there are commandment after commandment that are there to enhance the society, to unify the people to create justice and equality between all of humanity. Right? So there are many, many commandments in there and they're all there for wonderful uh, benefit for all of us. Ten commandments in the Quran, right? Are you surprised? <laughs> yes, there are ten command. well there are many commandments, but the ten commandments that many of you are used to, which are there in the Old Testament, in the book of, Ex uh, in the book of Exodus chapter 20 verse number 3, and also in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 5 verse number 6, most of them are also, actually all of them are mentioned in the Quran and they are distributed in different places. The very first one, there is no God except one, worship him alone. And next to it are the references from the Quran, the chapter and the verse. Alright, so I'm, I'm going to come now to a very, very important topic, a very serious topic and the topic which is out there in the media, right? And that is the topic of... Uh, extremism, violence and terrorism and somehow the media or some presidential candidates they make it as if Muslims are a threat, they are to be feared and they do not belong to civilized society, whatever language that they use. I'm not going to use emotional answers saying that no we are the most peaceful people, right? I could say that, I mean we are. But I'm going to supplement my answer by giving facts, as much evidence, as much you know, data as possible to justify the answer that when we look into the 1.7 billion Muslims around the world, yes, they are the good and the bad, right? But the good like majority, obviously, just like the people of any faith, the, the good apples and the bad apples. But I'm also going to dwell upon the bad apples which are there in the Muslim society. Why they are doing what they are doing. Not just what they are doing. We are going to like really briefly touch upon why they are doing some of the acts of hatred and terrorism and extremism. So if we are going to fight those people or any people who are doing these things, we have to know the cause. Knowing the cause will help us to come up with the solutions. So if we are going to categorize the Muslims into three different categories, one category would be the category of Muslims who are like minorities living like in the US or in the Europe. The second category of Muslims would be the ones living in the Muslim country and no war or dictatorship is imposed on them. The third category would be the category of Muslims of a few countries in which war dictatorship or oppression is imposed on them. So that will help us to identify the problem and to provide the solutions, right? So let's come to the first category of Muslim over here, Muslims. When we look at the Muslims in the USA, I'm just going to summarize by saying that Muslims in the USA, we are a model community when it comes to Muslims, the 7 to 11 million Muslims. When it comes to the data, we are the most charitable, we have the lowest divorce rate, we have, we have the, one of the highest education when it comes to the different communities, 
and we are the least threat to the society when it comes to crime when it comes to terrorism and when it comes to violence if mr trump is here he'll be surprised to find that out <laughs> right <laughs> and here are some statistics according to the fbi report from 1980 up until 2005 they found out that all the acts of terrorism which were done on the u.s soil muslims or supposedly muslims or attributed to the muslims they were only about six percent of them right not 94 percent not majority not like you know all of them only six percent and when i say only six percent we know that even one act of terrorism is too many even one loss of life is too many even one shedding of blood is too many too much i'm just comparing based on what is out there we have to compare and contrast to say that yes we also have our bad apples but not to the extent of what what the, what the media is showing according to the ap poll according to the yahoo poll they say that white supremacists are more dangerous to america than the foreign terrorist when it comes to europe in 2009 2010 and even now less than two percent of the acts of terrorism done on the soil of the usa they're done by people who label themselves as muslims there were 355 mass shootings last year right 355 there are too many only three of them they were attributed to the muslims so i'm not saying that muslims are angels but what i'm saying is that yes muslims have our bad apples but we are not the majority of the people who are doing these things so when you compare data by data community by community we see that muslims are a least threat to the society and not what the media is saying out there this slide may be surprising to some of you according to the public policy poll when they took this poll last year they found out that 57 percent of the republicans they want to replace the u.s constitution with christianity okay so let's compare now to the muslims who are living in muslim countries in which war is not imposed on, on them right so there are many many such countries you have uh, you have bangladesh you have indonesia you have turkey you have you have uh, indonesia malaysia different countries so those countries they are they have many different minorities in there they are accommodating them they are living in peace and harmony with them there are always some flares here and there right just like in any country but as a whole those countries are living in peace and justice and equality with the rest of the community war is not imposed on them let's come to the third very important category and that category my dear guest is the category of a few countries the muslim countries in which war is imposed on those countries like means the country of iraq the country of syria maybe the country of afghanistan and the country of pakistan maybe just a few other countries so when we look at those countries some of the questions that may come to your mind is you know how come there are so many terrorists violence extremism which is out there all of us we know that humanity when we look at our actions they are always going in action to reaction reaction to action and action to reaction no action is there in its isolation whenever we see somebody doing something we have to always look at the cause for why they are doing what they are doing do you all agree with that that action and reaction is the cycle of the human society so let's take a look about some of the reasons why extremists are doing why they are doing not to justify them by the way right there is no justification in islam or in christianity or in judaism or in humanity for killing any one innocent person but we have to understand why they are doing what they are doing now here is a fact one statement is going to kind of make that concept clear i would say that the extremist groups are a reaction 
to the extreme oppression that they feel is going on over them. It is a reaction to extremism or to oppression that they feel that somebody is doing over them. And here is the reason for it. You know, the drone operators, they could be sitting in Texas or in Europe or in different places. They came up on the news and they said 90% of those killed in the air strikes were not the intended targets. Then they continue. So these are the statements of the drone operators. We came to the realization that the innocent civilians we were killing only fuel the feeling of hatred that ignited terrorism and groups like ISIS while others served serving as fundamental recruitment tools. You know, my dear guest, it's very important that we love our families, our children, our parents, our spouses. If somebody murders, kills our people, means our innocent, our children, our families, we'll be angry. We'll have feeling of vengeance. We have, we have feeling of hate to the people who are doing this. That's a human reaction. It's not just a Muslim reaction, it's a human psychology. Not sure if they hate us for our freedoms or because the first one is true, the second one is true, so is the third one and the fourth one. When you look into the history of Iraq, and here is a fact, before 2003 there was not a single act of suicide bombing in the history of Iraq. Yes. Not a single act of suicide bombing in the history of Iraq. And same thing we could say of many, many countries that are doing this. So it's important. I'm not saying that, you know, yes, this is an excuse. But even Tony Blair, he made a statement to the same effect. That the groups who are doing extremism, they are reacting to the violence that are done by the British and by the US. It's a fact. And Hillary Clinton, and we have the video in which she said, um, you, so if you think if we walked away from this, didn't give them money today, it would be worse for us from a security standpoint? I do. I do. We're building a relationship that just did not exist. I said in our last trip when you were with me that we had a huge trust deficit, in part because the United States had, to be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after the Soviets inside Afghanistan. And we were successful. The Soviets left Afghanistan and then we said, great, goodbye, leaving these trained people who were fanatical in Afghanistan and Pakistan, leaving them well armed, creating a mess, frankly, that uh, at the time, we didn't really recognize. We were just so happy to see the Soviet Union fall, and we thought, okay, fine, we're, we're okay now. Everything's going to be so much better. Now you look back, the people we're fighting today, we were supporting in the fight against the Soviet. So it's important that for any action, there is a cause. For any cause, there is a reaction. And when we are going to take away the reaction, we have to make sure we have to identify the cause. And that cause is obviously that they feel that oppression is going on. They, it's not that the feeling, when they see that millions of their family members are lost because of drone missiles and by bombing, and resources are being taken away, occupation is taking place, their uh, people are uh, imposing dictators on them by the foreign powers. Human reaction is that people get angry, they have vengeance, and sometimes they take this vengeance in not the right way. So this is what human reaction. This is what the Quran teaches. The Quran says in chapter number 2, verse number 190, that fight in the cause of God for those who fight against you, but do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. This is the gold standard of Islam. Not human emotions, not feeling of vengeance, not our you know, own shortcomings or culture. This is the gold standard that God has given. So God is saying in that chapter of the Quran, in that verse of the Quran, chapter 2 verse number 190, that if 
war is imposed on you or somebody is trying to kill you or, or, or somebody is trying to compromise your life, your property, your family, you have the God-given right to defend yourselves. You know, for example, at 2 a.m. at night, you, he you hear a bang on your door. And when you look and you see that there are people out there, maybe they're gang members, like bad people trying to compromise and break down your door and come inside, what you do is obviously if you have an alarm system, you push the button, you call 911. If you have a baseball bat, you make sure you, you, you hold it, right? You want to defend yourself, your property and your family. Self-defense, it's a human nature. So Islam is saying that yes, in self-defense, you have the right to take up arms. But God is saying very, very clear, the gold standard of Islam is saying that even in a self-defense, do not go to extreme because God does not love the extremist. I'm quoting you from the Quran. So what are some of the extreme ways that God wants us to avoid? Chapter number 5 of the Quran, verse number 32, it says, that taking the life of one innocent person is like taking the life of all of humanity. Saving one life is like saving the life of all of humanity. And that is what Islam teaches. Muhammad, peace be upon him, in one of his defensive battles, he saw a woman dead. He became angry and he called his companions and he told them that even in a war, do not kill women and children. That means do not kill non-combatants. That means in Islam, there is no such thing as carpet bombing. In Islam, there is no such thing as Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There is no such thing in Islam that even if the enemy comes and touches and harms and destroys your civilian population, Islam does not give Muslims the right to go and harm or to kill even one single civilian of the enemy population. And that is what Islam teaches. Islam teaches that you cannot destroy the resources of the civilians of the enemy population, means the crops, uh, the animals, the water resources, the electrical resources. Islam, that's what it teaches, even in a just war. And last but not the least, it says in the Quran, chapter number 8, verse number 61, that if the enemy drops their weapons and, inc and incline towards peace, you also incline towards peace. Do not shoot them in the back. Incline towards peace. Sit down with them. Write down a peace treaty. Befriend them. Stop the war. You know, why, why do you think they're not fighting against the Chinese or Russians, for example? Why are they always coming to attack the Europeans, the Americans, the Canadians and the Australians? Because they see that they are the ones who have compromised their families, their land and their resources. I'm not justifying what they're doing, but it's very important. Human psychology, right? Cause and effect. Cause and effect. So it's very important for us to realize. All right, so let's come to the Sharia law, right? Sharia law, in a nutshell, it is a how-to manual. It's a how-to manual to establish justice and peace in the society. You know, just like we have a how-to manual, when somebody becomes a new employee, you have a how-to manual for the new employees, for a new student. When you're learning how to drive, that's a how-to manual, which is like the rules of the road. So Sharia law is a how-to manual. It's God's guidance that God gave in the Quran and through example of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, how we can establish justice, equality and peace in the society. We say that Sharia law was also given to Prophet Jesus and also given to Prophet Moses. You know the Ten Commandments that you saw. We say that that was the part of the Sharia law that was given to Moses. You know, when, when the Ten Commandments says that worshipping one God, being good to your parents, do not lie, do not cheat, do not murder, we say that was part of the Sharia law given to the Jewish people through Moses. When it says in the book of Leviticus, chapter 11, verse number 3, that do not eat pork, we say that was part of the Sharia law given to Prophet Moses. The dietary laws, the cultural, the clothing and the, and the spiritual laws that were given. What comes to your mind when you think of the Sharia law? What could be like... Go ahead. Cutting people's heads off. 
Yeah, you know, sometimes, uh, I mean, most of the time when we think of the Sharia law, the cutting part comes to mind, right? This, 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 correct? <laughs> the punishment. In Saudi Arabia, isn't that right? The uh, yes. January 16th this year, 47 people were publicly beheaded in Saudi Arabia. Right, right. So, the very first thing that comes to our minds or the media portrays about the Sharia law is about the punishment system, right? About punishment. But let me give this analogy to all of you, right? Let's, let's look at this analogy. Let's look at our friends over here. Well, if people from Mars, if they come, if they come down on Earth, and if they ask me the question, you know, Sabil, what is the US Constitution about? And if I tell them that the US Constitution, it kills people. It kills people, that's all I say, and then they leave. Now let me ask you this question. Am I doing justice to the US Constitution? No. I'm not because I only mentioned like maybe like 0.5% of the US Constitution. I left the breadth and the beauty of the US Constitution. All the wonderful benefits, the sponsorship, the education, the services to the elderly, uh, to the homeless people that the US Constitution provides. In the same way, in the Sharia law, there is like less than 0.5% of the Sharia law speaks about the punishment system, the penal system. But the rest of the Sharia law, it speaks about the wonderful benefits, the guidance, the solutions that is there for humanity and for the individual. So when you look at the Quran, 6,000 plus passages in here less than 15 percent not 15 percent actually less than 15 passages speaks about the punishment system that's it the rest of the sharia law present here speaks about the rest of the wonderful ways that humanity individuals and the family could benefit i have some bad news here <laughs> the food is going to be late <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm only a messenger. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Maybe like 15 minutes or so. If all of you could tolerate, I would really appreciate, right? <laughs> all right. <laughs> Get him. <laughs> so these are some of the examples. Honoring your parents, giving freedom of religion and expression to the people. Being good to your neighbors. You know, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, you are not a believer, you are not a Muslim. If you eat your full and your neighbors are hungry, you are not a believer. That's what Sharia law says. Conducting marriages, establishing families, you know, the, all the rituals of the marriage ceremonies, providing rights to the women, giving charity to the poor, guidance to the families, parents, children, uh, smiling at each other. So these are parts of the Sharia law. When we are giving charity to the poor, the needy, the homeless, you know, especially in Chicago, there are thousands and thousands of people. When you go there in the, in, in the downtown area, when you give a dollar, two, five dollars, we are practicing the Sharia law. When I'm sharing my knowledge over here, I am practicing the Sharia law in front of all of you. So it's very important. Sharia law is God's guidance that God has given for individual and for humanity. So if some people in the Middle East or some places, they may use the word Sharia law, they may use the word Jihad, they may say Allahu Akbar or Bismillah, and if they are doing acts of violence, they are going against the gold standard, which is the Quran. If they are killing the minorities or forcefully trying to convert them or suppressing the women, obviously they are deluded, brainwashed, they are in the wrong, and here is the gold standard, which is which are the teachings of Islam. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I noticed on slides, <coughs> un unless I'm getting this wrong, it, it appeared as though the punishment for death was chopping off the hands. Um, if that's the case, I, I really need an answer to that. <coughs> that seems really cruel and really wrong. Okay, so the question is, perhaps in the slide I may have shown that punishment for theft is chopping of the hands. If that is so, you feel that it is very cruel and unusual punishment, correct? Okay, sure, sure. So it's very important that when it comes to any 
punishment system in Islam, you know, just like in the US Constitution, there are consequences for any theft, any cheating, any lying, any murder, there are consequences. But those punishments, like suppose if the person sees that somebody has stolen a loaf of bread in the bakery, the baker does not have the right to punish the person by the US Constitution, right? It has to be taken to the court. And the court is going to decide, listening from both sides, the video evidence, whatever evidence. In the same way, in Islam, for theft or for any punishment way or for any, for any crime, there are always checks and balances to see that what is the amount the person is stealing. Was that item, was it placed like outside of the store, easy access or was it hidden and the person took, and took it. So all of those things are taken into consideration but a very important thing taken into consideration is has the state, the country, the government has have they been meeting the basic needs of this person? If the state fail to meet the basic needs of the person, that means the state is responsible for what the person is doing. And I'll give you one example. During the time of the second caliph, whose name is Umar, during his time there was a famine, right? Drought and famine. So the state was not able to meet the needs of the people. During that time, the punishment system, especially for the theft, it was abolished. Do you understand? So all of these things have to be taken into consideration. It's not just, okay, suppose somebody stole like 10 cents from a store and now their hands are chopped off, right? The amount, how it is placed, how is the state me meeting the needs of the people, after all the checks and balances, that's when some punishment is given. Now, sometimes we may feel that some other religions, some other faiths, punishment system may be a little bit harsh, right? Now, let's compare and contrast in Europe, to the best of my knowledge, or maybe in majority of the European countries, there is no death penalty. Am I right? Okay, now, we have death penalty in some of the states in the USA. Compared to the European people, our, us killing, like in Texas, we are doing something barbaric, inhumane, taking the life of an individual. Only God could do it. It's how we look at it. And last very important point is chopping of hand, death penalty, stoning by death, these are not unique to Islam. If you look at the Old Testament, there are passages after passages, Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Abusing your parents, disrespecting to parents, it is stoning to death. Adultery is stoning to death. Not being a virgin on the wedding night is stoning to death. All of these, these are God's commandments. Some of you who are from the Jewish and the Christian faith, these are all some of the things now we could say that you know why but if you say that these are God's commandments yes they may have came like centuries ago so what we are saying is that the punishment system in Islam there's a checks and balances with all of the due checks and balances and these punishments are not unique to Islam they're also there in previous scriptures right so that's that's all I'm saying regarding that aspect so I hope you get a more context and perspective and the historical and the scriptural context to it. In this country over here, despite all the greatness of this country, there are no less than 93,000 rapes in this country. And these are only reported rapes. Okay? That's tragic. You know, even one single one is too many. The people, if they are caught, average, they spend five to seven years in prison if they are caught revolving door policy so what islam says is that if the person is committing a heinous act compromising the pe person's dignity that means they have to be such punishment that means other future rapists it will teach them a lesson you could say that yeah let's be lenient to the rapists and what now what about the 93000 more who are going to be raped so what Islam is saying is that, yes, you may say it's barbaric, 
But if those laws are going to prevent 93,000 more rapes, yes, barbaric for one person, but dignity for the 93,000, which one do we choose? Thank you very much.